I think I'll immediately go to share screen so that you can um, see my PowerPoint. Okay. So um, thank you for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak in a new context uh, to a different audience. In this case, uh, I guess Columbia undergrads amongst others, uh, rather than my normal Georgetown uh, undergrad setting. Um, so this talk takes me back to uh, my dissertation topic. So that, that was uh, quite a few years ago, but in more recent years, I've come back to it because the field of Buddhism and literature is really starting to uh, uh, heat up, I'm, I'm glad to say. People think it's it's uh, an interesting and important thing to do to study Buddhism through creative literature. So the topic uh, of tonight's talk is the Buddhist dream tale. And um, the central question is, what is the Buddhist dream tale? And I hope by the end of this lecture to answer that question, but in um, a bit of an unexpected way where I kind of turn the question on its head, or maybe you might say, I ultimately end up ignoring the question, uh, but I think I answer it, you know, uh, perhaps from a different uh, and not expected perspective. But let me begin with a preliminary consideration and definition of the Buddhist dream tale. Um, first, it's, it's just important to observe that in uh, pre-modern East Asia, references to dreams in literature are legion. Uh, it's a very common way uh, of um, explaining events as well as of telling a story. So I, I just wanted to get that out there with some sense of the spectrum of dream interpretation. And of course, you don't have anything like Freudian dream interpretation but you do have the use of dreams as prognostication uh, and often of auspicious birth. So um, a good example of that would be the story of the Buddha's own birth, that uh, he was conceived when his mother, Queen Maya, dreamt that a white elephant entered her side. So this dream is a prognostication of uh, this uh, extraordinary man uh, being born who would become uh, the Buddha, but it was also used uh, as a form of medical diagnosis, dreams uh, as a guide to, you know, what's ailing uh, the patient. They were seen as messages from spirits uh, and experiences of the soul when separated from the body. So um, the last interpretation of dreams would be within the realm of shamanism and the idea that shamans can also, uh, both be occupied by spirits, but that their soul can leave the body uh, and experience uh, otherworldly realms. Okay, there's also the idea of the dream adventure tale that can be found both in Europe and in Tang, China. And this is a much more narrowly defined um, kind of dream narrative where there's a threefold structure in which the protagonist, usually a male, well, always a male, has a certain vision of grandeur. He, he uh, conceives a longing about um, achieving success, uh, whether in politics um, or in love, and often it's both. And then he falls asleep and dreams that he attains all the goals, you know, that he's conceived uh, in his waking state. Um, and there's the temporal illusion of time in that, uh, usually in the story, before the man falls asleep, uh, some event begins, like a, a candle is lit or a, a pot of rice is set to cook. And by the time he wakes up from the dream, he sees that the rice has just uh, finished cooking or the candle 
has finished burning down. So in other words, within the dream, he lives a whole life, but upon awakening, the time measuring device demonstrates that only a short amount of time has passed in which he's dreamt of a, a whole life adventure. So this is one very narrow way uh, of defining the dream tale. Um, but I'm gonna go somewhere in between this very broad and very narrow view of the dream tale and define the Buddhist dream tale as a combination of both Taoist and Buddhist teachings um, to create a, fr a frame tale. That is a story within a story. And the dream is that story within the story. And the protagonist uh, passes through an entire life, wakes up from the dream, and then awakens to realize the vanity uh, of worldly desires. Now, in, in some ways, this is very close to the dream adventure tale, but there's not necessarily a time measuring device. And I, I think in Kun Mong, uh, the dream of the nine clouds, you don't have that element, the time measuring device when uh, Xiaoyou or Song Jin wakes up from his dream. And also in the Buddhist dream tale, uh, you can either have a dream in which the protagonist attains all his worldly desires, or um, he attains it initially, but it goes bad. So I'm gonna give you an example uh, of both. Now, um, before getting into Kun Mong uh, and another dream tale, uh, I wanna um, briefly consider the rise of classic fiction in China and, and Korea, and of course, Kun Mong, the Nine Cloud Dream by Kim Man Jung, is I think at this point considered the first full length work of literary fiction in Korea. I know there's some debates about um, the novel Hong Gyu Dong, uh, but I believe currently it's believed Hong Gyu Dong was actually um, written in the 19th century, which would make Kun Mong the first full length work of literary fiction in Korea. And um, I want to consider the status of uh, classic fiction, uh, especially in relation to Western understandings uh, of fiction and, and the novel. Okay, so in the modern context, um, the novel is defined to be a creative work stemming from the mind and inspiration and imagination of the individual author. And the emphasis here would be on individual authorship and the author's own creativity and genius uh, and uh, originality. Okay. In the context of Chinese and Korean classic fiction, that's not the understanding of the fictional work because in fact, and this is based on you know, literary evidence, uh, classical fiction arises from the category of what one might call external or extraneous history. In other words, it's a subset of history because uh, these stories claim to be accounts of true events. Um, and their accounts of unusual or even occult um, and wondrous events that are not included in the official historical records. And this claim, I think, has to be understood in relation to the Chinese practice of history or historiography and its literary hegemony, meaning that in the Chinese and then consequently in the Korean context, history was considered to be the most important form of narrative. Why? Because history was didactic. First of all, histories focused on dynasties, the rise and fall of political dynasties. It focused on documenting the uh, actions and personalities of the leaders of those who established the dynasties and also the, the final and last rulers of the dynasty with the idea that 
this kind of history or historical narrative would teach people how virtuous men rose to power and men who lacked in virtue lost power, uh, thereby ending their dynastic um, lineage, um, as well as you know, their own personal hold on power. So um, in contrast to this, actively fictive works were seen as, mm, one might say, not, not worthy focus because the emphasis was an account of true events so that we could learn its political as well as moral lessons. So um, I'm gonna go back to the Korean context to see how they followed this value system uh, that saw history as the most important brand uh, of narrative. So the Samguk Sagi or History of the Three Kingdoms uh, is modeled on the grand historian Sima Qian of the, uh, the Han Dynasty and his historical records known as the Shurji. And the Samguk Sagi as a kind of uh, history, a political history of the, the Three Kingdoms period uh, now comprises the oldest surviving chronicles of Korean history. And it covers the first century before the common era to the seventh uh, century of the common era, uh, covering the, uh, the kingdoms of Pekche, Koguryo, and Shilla, you know, before the unified Shilla um, period uh, in the seventh century. This text was compiled based on older dynastic records in 1145 by Kim Pushik, who was a government official. So, you know, notice this. This is written as a public document uh, within the domain of um, public history, right, for political purposes. And correspondingly, this document or, or record was ordered by King Injong of the Koryo dynasty, um, essentially as a way of um, sort of bringing these historical records up to his own period so that his own um, dynastic activity can be legitimated as based on um, his own virtuous rule. Okay, so you have the Samguk Sagi, but a century or two after that, Oh, just uh, actually uh, about a century later, you have the construction of this other text, the Samguk Yusa, the legends of the three kingdoms. And so these records are in that category of a kind of leftover history, the history of really interesting, marvelous, strange events uh, that are not included in the official historical records, but needs to be documented, right? Because it's history as well. So Yusa, these Chinese characters have the connotation of leftover matters, right? But it means it's still history, right? But it's not political history because there are records of strange and wondrous events and Chuanxi is, uh, is the Chinese term. Uh, for this category of um, records. Uh, so as an example, the Samguk Yusa includes the legend of Tangun, who is the legendary founder of Korea's first dynasty way back in 2333 before the common era. And, you know, obviously it's mythological because it's the story of how Tangun was born of a bear who was turned into a woman uh, because she stayed in a cave and ate nothing but mugwort and garlic as instructed by the son of heaven. And then she married the son of heaven and they gave birth to Tangun. So certainly qualifies as a strange and wondrous event. And look at this, it was compiled by a Buddhist monk. So Buddhist monks in East Asia seem to have always been very active in compiling these kinds of stories that eventually led to the rise of fiction. And I, I won't get into the reasons for that right now, except to say that 
Buddhist monks thought these sorts of stories were really useful for illustrating Buddhist teachings. But I just want you to keep that um, identification or close association in mind, Buddhism and legendary narratives. Okay, so from the Sanguk Yusa, I'm gonna give you an example of the most famous Buddhist dream tale because the Sanguk Yusa includes lots of stories about Buddhist images and temples and the unusual uh, events uh, associated with them. And the tale of Shin the monk is I think one of the most well-known stories from the Samguk Yusa. In fact, I know that there was some decades ago, a TV movie was made of it in, in Korea. But let me give you the basic um, um, storyline there. Okay, so there's this young monk named Cho Shin and she, he falls in love with the magistrate's daughter who's engaged to be wed to another man, all right? And so this creates um, much suffering and heart pangs uh, for Cho Shin. So he prays to Guanam Bodhisattva, uh, Chinese known as Guanin Bodhisattva, the female uh, Bodhisattva that's so important in Chinese, Korean, uh, Japanese Buddhism. So he prays to an image of Guanam Bodhisattva. Um, the daughter appears to Joshin and says, actually, I'm in love with you and I wanna be with you. So they run away together uh, they live for 50 years and have five children, but over these decades, the couple fall into poverty to the point where their son dies from starvation and their daughter is reduced to begging, to trying to keep the family alive. So the couple decide to part ways to, to I don't know, I guess divide and conquer. I'm not sure what the uh, logic is. And at that moment when Shoshin is uh, really in the throngs of the grief uh, and pain of what his family has come to, he awakens from his dream, okay? And you have the time measuring device. The burnt stump of a candle shows that only one night has passed, right? In the temple uh, when he was praying to Guanim Bodhisattva. Um, but uh, the story says that Joshin's hair turned gray in the course of the night, signifying that he has indeed lived or experienced uh, a lifetime worth of events. And um, I want to focus on the concluding poem of the tale of Joshin uh, to, as a way of getting at the meaning and the purpose of the Buddhist dream tale. So the poem says, to assess one's self-cultivation, first make the mind sincere. Widowers dream of beautiful women, thieves of hoarding treasure, but how can those compare to autumn dreams in the still of the night? Often one arrives at clear understanding with eyes closed. Okay, so let's dwell on the message of the entire dream tale. Uh, which is that first, it's difficult to cultivate the mind uh, in the Buddhist manner to, to purify one's intentions. You know, I mean, we humans have weaknesses uh, and our desires uh, and our attachments. And so uh, these are very difficult things to overcome. So the last two lines says that the autumn dreams in the still of the night enables one to arrive at clear understanding, even though you're sleeping, even though the eyes are closed. So what is that signifying? What is that suggesting? It's saying that dreams are very powerful. Dreams can, in a sense, be um, uh, almost uh, kind of shorthand, Right? I mean, compared to an entire life, a dream is very short, uh, but it can uh, be just as effective as an entire life in bringing one to understanding. All right. So the message here is the power of the dream, especially relative to what we would call life itself or what we would call real life. All right. So that's an essential part of the message. Now, let's turn to the ending of Kun Mong, 
All right, so I know that the students have read this novel, and but not all of you might have. So Kun Meng as a Buddhist dream tale is the story of Xing Jin, who is again, the young Buddhist monk uh, who encounters eight lovely fairy women, which kind of awakens his desire. And so he has a dream in which in contrast to Cho Xin, all of his dreams are fulfilled, both politically uh, and in terms of love. So he ends up with those eight fairy maidens as his wives and concubines. And plus Xing uh, Zhen, known as Xiao Yu in the dream, uh, uh, comprise the nine clouds uh, of the title of the novel. But even for all his success, at the end of the dream sequence, uh, Xiaoyu feels this kind of uh, sadness, uh, feels a kind of pathos, if you will. And when his lovely wives and concubines asks him, why are you sad? He says, well, I realize that despite all the success, you know, it's so brief. And this is invoking another central Buddhist idea that everything is impermanent. So even if you attain all the success, all the pleasures that you could want, it's still ultimately a form of vanity because it's short-lived, okay? So life itself is short-lived. And the Buddhist saying is that life itself is a dream because at the end you realize how it all passed in the blink of an eye. And for those of you who are undergraduates, this might not really resonate with you, but believe me, the older you get, the more it does resonate. You know, the older you get, the more you realize how fast time has passed. So I want to compare the concluding lines of Ku and Mong, where Xing Zhen, the now awoken uh, young Buddhist monk, says uh, to his master Liu Guan, uh, Master, you have awakened my mind in a dream of one night. Liu Guan, the master responds, you say the dream and the world are two separate things. And that is because you have, you have yet to awaken from the dream. To which Xing Zhen replies, I cannot tell if the dream was not reality or if this reality is not a dream. Um, the use of the double negative can uh, be a little bit confusing here. But I mean, the, the point here is he can't tell the difference between what is dream and what is real life. So he is modifying his initial statement of his lesson, which is that he has awoken to reality. And Liu Guan, the master, corrects him by confusing um, Xing Zhen's notion of separation between dream and reality. And so, of course, this is uh, a part of uh, the Buddhist message. And it's also very much rooted in the Taoist uh, Zhuangzi uh, and his infamous story of the butterfly dream, where Zhuangzi says that he dreamt he was a butterfly. But upon awakening, he couldn't tell whether he was now um, the butterfly dreaming that he's Zhuangzi, all right? So this, this idea that dream and what we take to be reality are phenomenologically inseparable, that one is no more real than the other uh, is uh, the essence of the the message um, that's conveyed, uh, I think, more strongly in Kun Meng um, than in the, the dream of Cho Xin. The dream of Cho Xin says, dreaming is very powerful in what it can do for you in terms of awakening wisdom. But Kun Meng is perhaps, well, I don't know if it's more Buddhist, but it's adding another element, a critical element, um, as uh, also contributed by the Zhuangzi butterfly tale that dream and reality are essentially indistinguishable. Okay, so I'm gonna um, ask the question, why did Kim Manjung write Kun Meng? Um, 
Finkel, uh, the translator of the Nine Cloud Dream, whose uh, uh, translation I assume you read, suggests that part of what Kim Man Jung is doing is he is idealizing court life through the dream tale in a way that kind of um, mitigates or makes up for Kim Man Jung's own much more difficult historical experience of court life. Um, Kim Man Jung was exiled by the king and from the court where he, his position was to be very close to, to the king because of the political faction uh, that he occupied. But the king had a lot of troubles with women and Kim Man Jung seemed to uh, always end up on the wrong side of, of the, the king's desires and decisions about, you know, like overthrowing his current wife to elevate a favored concubine uh, to the new wife. So interesting how the king's relations with women were fraught and caused a lot of political problems, especially for Kim Man Jung. And in his own dream tale, instead you see the relations with women and between women being very harmonious, uh, particularly from the male point of view. Uh, the women are never jealous of each other and they kind of fight each other to, to uh, purvey each other's charms um, to, to Song Jin. Um, so I, I would say, you know, there's there's something to that. Uh, certainly he wrote this novel uh, as a kind of antidote, perhaps, to his own actual life. Um, I would also veer towards the idea that the novel itself, like the other dream tales before it, reflects on the symmetry between dream and reality. Um, and clearly we've seen that just in the uh, concluding lines of Ku and Mong itself. And so that leads me to also suggest that he's asserting the greater phenomenological power of the imagination and therefore of his own art, that is his own novel over reality itself. And what I mean to signify by this is we seem to have a bleeding over at this point from the question of what is the Buddhist dream tale to what does the ideas behind the dream tale, which really points to the power of the artistic imagination, uh, the power of fiction, that it becomes um, an inverted process where the, I, the phenomenology of dream becomes a reflection on the power of the human imagination and of artistic practice, such as fiction. And uh, as you'll see very shortly, um, film as well. So this, this is really my pivotal point that I'm, I'm taking the question, what is the Buddhist dream tale and parlaying it into a different kind of question or observation, which is what does the dream tale say to us or illustrate to us philosophically about the power of the imagination? Uh, the imagination constructed by things like literary fiction and film. So I'm going to um, move to a very contemporary dream tale, The Wizard of Oz. And uh, I'm going to show, uh, since I've been focusing on the ending portion, waking up from the dream, uh, in the tale of Zhou Xin and in the tale of uh, uh, Song Jing, uh, let me play briefly uh, this ending segment of The Wizard of Oz. Wake up, honey. Place like home. There's no place like home. There's no. Dorothy, Dorothy dear, it's Aunt Em, darling. 
juxtaposing this scene uh, with the bits of text we examine uh, from the Korean sources, you can, you can certainly see a thematic similarity, I hope, or convergence in their discussion, in Dorothy's um, discussion about her dreams, where you have the skeptical onlookers who are kind of chuckling uh, about her confusion about her dream, but Dorothy insisting that it was a real place, right? She, she talks about, um, she talks in terms of the reality of her experience. Um, and the way the, the movie concludes, it also suggests that as a result of the dream, uh, her initial desire to find a place over the rainbow, right? to go somewhere other than she is, which is that very black and white or sepia toned um, location of Kansas is something that has been fulfilled. Uh, and because of the power of the dream, she's now on the other side of, of that desire. All right, so you can, you can see those structural parallels. Um, does that mean that The Wizard of Oz is a Buddhist dream tale? Well, let me, uh, before tackling that question, get to some analysis uh, of The Wizard of Oz from a um, current, um, I guess, scholar of film. Uh, I'm taking this from James Walter's book, Alternative Worlds in Hollywood Cinema in which he devotes uh, a chapter to The Wizard of Oz. Um, but what was really interesting to me is his observation of the medium of cinema itself and how the medium of film makes the dream real because of how film depicts dreams. So he says, the effect is created not so much of a character merely having a dream, but rather of existing within a dreamed world. There are actions captured by the camera just as they are in the film's real fictional worlds. In other words, what he's saying, and I think this is true of the novel as well, the dream tale novel, as well as a film, what the media, does is it depicts the dream sequence just as realistically as it depicts the outer frame tale. And in the case of The Wizard of Oz, you might say the dream sequence, if you'll recall, is in living color, very saturated, bright colors. Um, this, this world is brought to animation 
and life in a way uh, that contrasts very distinctly, you know, to the uh, much more dull depiction of Kansas. Uh, also, um, so uh, in, in the cinematic world, the dream world uh, is given a visual space and a visual reality that's no different from the depiction of the quote unquote real world of Kansas. And if you think about the novel, that's the same too. In Kuun Mong, the depiction of the dream sequence is much longer uh, than the depiction of the outer frame tale. And the dream narrative is told uh, in a uh, realistic fashion, or at least a fashion that's as realistic as uh, the depiction of the outer world. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that uh, it's, it's the medium uh, of literature and film that's really interesting in what they say about the dream, or at least in how they depict the dream. And as a result, the way they make the dream sequence very powerful for the reader, reader or audience. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to um, something else that Walter says uh, regarding the Wizard of Oz, uh, where he brings some uh, skepticism to this idea that the dream has effectively solved Dorothy's wanderlust, right? Her desire to move away from the kind of um, colorless life of Kansas to find something more um, captivating. So he says, through its depiction of Dorothy's home life, the film has a uh, the film has effectively, uh, okay, let me just move the little thumbnail, right, called into question her relief in returning. So creating a mood that jars with the sentiment of her words. The neatness of a happy ending is thus rendered unsatisfactory as we are led to question whether Dorothy is aware of her environment's shortcomings or whether indeed she is tricking herself into believing that she could be forever happy there. All right, so what is Walter saying? He's saying that, and this is his reading of the film and that scene that we just saw where he feels that Dorothy's relationships in the land of Oz with the, the scarecrow, tin man and, and lion, um, is much more fulfilling, much more warm uh, than her life and relations in the real world of Kansas. And so in a sense, Walters is calling into question the effectiveness of the dream in solving the problems uh, of Dorothy's desires and accomplishing the Buddhist goal of using the dream to, to, in a sense, um, teach uh, as if an actual lifetime worth of experience has been undertaken and you know, wisdom derived from that. So um, he, Walters may be kind of arguing against the notion of the dream tale or at least the Buddhist interpretation of the dream tale, but I think it's a very effective and useful observation here because it also has the effect of calling attention to how the dream, how the illusion of literature and film is itself what is so powerful. And this comports with a fundamental Buddhist message about the illusory nature of our own lives and what we take to be reality. And so in order to, hmm, I'm having this problem again. In order to, oh, okay, good. Um, demonstrate how the movie itself of The Wizard of Oz expresses a self-awareness um, of its own medium I'm going to show you the scene in which Dorothy transitions uh, from the land of Kansas to the land of, of Oz. And I'm not gonna show you the whole clip. I'm gonna fast forward to the, the critical 
portion. You don't suppose she could really be sick, do you? Oh, oh. Yes, 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 Okay, I'm going to stop it here because unfortunately this clip doesn't have the actual transition to when Dorothy opens the door of the house to the outside and then you see the full living, first full living color image of the, the Land of Oz, which, you know, makes for a very distinct visual marker of a transition. So what I want to uh, focus on instead from this scene is the way um, her window, the window to the outside world functions in the course of this sequence. Um, I'm happy to uh, like take a response perhaps from one of the students uh, at this point, because I'm almost finished with my presentation. We're gonna segue into the Q&A but uh, could anyone answer me the question, how does her window function in, in the course of this scene? What is the role played by her window that she looks outside of? Any response? See, I'm a very experienced undergraduate teacher. I, I don't mind at all waiting. Um, if anyone's like raising hand, I can't see. So I would um, just jump in.
So let me uh, stop share and um, well, I see someone in the Q and A. The window represents her awakeness or transition from it to sleep. Okay, right, right. That is true. It is a transition uh, to sleeping and therefore to dreaming. So I think it is a prelude to what, what is going to unfold as the dream tale. Um, and I think uh, perhaps um, even more specific response can be uh, given to that. Okay, so I have another response here. I'm not sure, but I guess it works as the border between the dreaming and reality. Yes, yes, I think that uh, echoes what was said before. Um, oh, I see. Okay, that's why you're not able to speak. Okay. Uh, oh, I guess I need to look. Yeah, I'm looking at the Q&A. Um, so does any, well, okay, just in the interest of time, uh, let me provide um, what I think is the right answer, but you know, it's my interpretation. The window functions as a movie frame. So in a sense, Dorothy is sitting in her room and she's looking out the window and she's watching a movie. And so that scene is, is a prelude to the movie of the dream that we're, uh, we're about to see. It's a transition to that dream slash movie. And what that scene is signifying and, and, and underscoring is you're watching a movie. And, and so is Dorothy, she's watching a movie. So you see the movie and the dream are really interchangeable. They're, they're coeval, they're uh, the same thing. So if um, in the Buddhist point of view, a dream has so much power to liberate and has the same phenomenological status as um, life experience, then what is that saying, right? Uh, about the power of art. Okay, so let me go to my final slide. So what is the Buddhist dream tale? Revisiting this question. Okay, so in what ways the Wizard of Oz Buddhist, given that the, um, the original author, L. Frank Baum and the screenwriters, and there were many screenwriters uh, that went into constructing the movie. Um, as far as I know, none of them were self-consciously professing Buddhists, although I have heard that Frank Baum was a theosophist. I, I tried to pursue that a little bit. I couldn't find much um, discussion or evidence of it. And I won't get into what theosophy is here, but it was a kind of updated 19th century Buddhism plus modern science kind of uh, new form of uh, Western Buddhism. Uh, but for the time being, we'll say, you know, I mean, there's no known intentionality on the part of anyone associated with the original story or the movie that, you know, we're constructing a Buddhist dream tale. All right. So given that we can't pursue that route, I think what I want to suggest is we have to ask a different question and make a different kind of observation, which is that the artistic media of literary fiction and, the, and film themselves as media instantiate the Buddhist observation about the power of imaginary worlds. Now, whether you label that a Buddhist insight or just a normal uh, insight that movies are powerful, novels are powerful, you know, so powerful that a lot of people seem to have a problem distinguishing between what they saw in a movie or TV series uh, and what is in fact real. You've probably heard stories of that kind all the time. So it's not just a Buddhist observation, but I think it's, it's through the Buddhist filter and Buddhist lenses that we can make more specific sense 
of and a case for the religious seriousness of such art uh, that initially in the East Asian context, purely imaginary works were seen to be, um, if not frivolous uh, or frivolous at best and at worst, right? Corrupting of morals. You, you, you find this um, critique of imaginary literature in a lot of cultures, you know, that it's frivolous and they talk about juicy stuff like sex and love and people who behave badly. And so we don't want that around, but it's in the context of the, of the Buddhist observation about the illusory nature of life and the power of illusion to nevertheless reflect on the illusory nature of life that gives legitimation and sanction to these, what we might call, uh, certainly in this day and age, purely secular um, pursuits, secular literary or artistic pursuits. Um, the captivating nature of fictional worlds can be a powerful antidote to suffering when coupled with the realization of the illusory nature of reality um, itself. Okay, just a brief summation of this idea sort of if life itself is an illusion, um, it is full of suffering because our power of imagination is constricted and anemic uh, in ways that have been cultivated by general society. You know, there is a failure of the imagination in our own lives uh, and in what we take to be kind of non-negotiable reality. And the point here is that the power of the imagination um, can be a powerful antidote to what we normally imagine to be real. And we, we think it's real only because we're just sort of used to that um, form of fantasy um, as, as being ordinary, as, as being normative. So this idea that you're gonna fight illusion with illusion, right? But a, a more powerful, compact form of illusion that also leads to, you know, greater compassion and ultimately more happiness. Now, uh, relative to Walter's, um, oh, okay, I guess that was my final point. Relative to Walter's uh, observation that once you wake up from the dream or once you finish the novel that might make you feel good and imagine a better life, you know, um, we find that uh, we go back to our ordinary depressing lives. Um, and yeah, that might often be the case, but there's a whole other argument to be made here about um, the use of artistic media such as film and fiction ritualistically uh, in a ritual sense of activating a kind of cosmic time in which you can hone more skillful um, habits of mind and perspectives uh, on the world that eventually bleeds over into what you think of as your ordinary depressing um, everyday life. So I'll leave it at that uh, since we're right at about the hour uh, mark. And uh, I hope to take your questions um, about any of this, which you know I deliberately leave kind of open-ended so that perhaps people might like want to argue back and say, well, what about this? What about that? And so forth. But thank you for your attention. Well, I think, uh... Professor Cho for really a great and insightful lecture. So, you know, uh, you can ask a question uh, by using a function uh, there, like a raise a hand or a chat or a QA. a So you can type there, or if you want to really speak your question yourself, then you, know, you can raise hand function. You can use raise hand function. Professor Kim, are you going to... Um do the moderating, the calling on hands or the asking of question that perhaps, you know, just, just to be consistent.
So, you know, just to start uh, uh, the, this q and session, you know, I have this simple question. You know, uh, you kind of argue that this novel or this literary work uh, could function as a kind of, you know, uh, uh, a tool to uh, give this idea uh, 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 for a Buddhist uh, awakening or Buddhist realization. Uh, but things that, you know, this novel was written by a Confucian uh, scholar who studied Buddhism. But I kind of just wonder how many, uh, you know, Korean Buddhists around this time really kind of, you know, use uh, this, you know, literary tour to, you know, maybe kind of attract more people to Buddhism or, yeah, well, you know, if not, then why uh, didn't they use uh, this, you know, this powerful uh, tour? Uh, well, so that goes back to my observation that the Samuguk Yusa was um, collated by a Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. And the question of why did a Buddhist monk do that? I mean, no one asked him to do it. Uh, like, uh, I can't remember the uh, official's name who put together the Samguk Sagi. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't under the aegis of the court or the king, the Buddhist monk, Ilion, did it of his own free will, all right? Um, and you have other examples, um, like uh, in Japan, the uh, Konjaku Monogatari Shu mm -hmm. is another, uh, it's at the end of the 12th century. So very similar time period where another Buddhist monk collected all these stories having to do with Buddhism in India, in China, and then into uh, Korea and Japan. Uh, but these sto uh, stories extended to secular tales that really had nothing to do with Buddhist monks or Buddhist temples. So just, you know, interesting stories about unusual events. Mm -hmm. So why did Buddhist monks collect them? Because they found them to be useful vehicles for sermons. So often, um, at temples, at Buddhist temples, you could go, the public could go there and hear lectures given by monks. And often in the course of these lectures, monks would tell stories because they're very engaging, right? And these stories also claim to be accounts of actual events. A lot of these stories are designed to prove the the supernatural wondrous powers of Buddhist images and temples or to just simply tell the story of its origins. Um, but the whole point is to engage, to be engaging. So they were used by Buddhists. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but I think uh, there's a difference maybe you're pointing to uh, between writing a Buddhist dream mm -hmm. tale as opposed to collecting mm -hmm. or telling and repeating them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Kim Manjung was a very high ranking Confucian scholar official. Um, why did he, of all people, uh, turn to writing a Buddhist dream tale? Well, okay, so um, I think it had everything to do with those moments when he was disaffected with the whole Confucian based political and moral system because he suffered for it. Right? He was in exile. Mm -hmm. And Buddhist and Taoist thought has have always functioned in the East Asian context as the alternative ideology to Confucianism. And just because you were a good Confucian and educated in the Confucian texts and passed the examinations, you know, the state examinations, which required knowledge of Confucian teachings, doesn't mean that you didn't know the Buddhist texts. If you were educated, you knew both. And both ideologies were utilized depending on the mm -hmm. phase of life or even the moment uh, of, of one's existence. So. Uh, I think this is a, a classic paradigm where one could turn to Buddhism and Taoist sentiments, especially when the whole political structure disappointed you, whether individually or in the context of dynastic collapse, mm -hmm. right? So in periods of great political turmoil, 
it was common for good Confucian scholar officials to turn to Buddhism and Taoism and say, oh, it's all vanity, it's just a dream, it's nonsense. But as soon as they're called back to court, oh, then they were good Confucian scholar officials again, right? Nothing wrong with taking advantage of multiple systems, even if they are at war at, with each other, because all of us have multiple identities as we pass through time and phases of life. Okay, thank you. So any uh, question? Again, uh, you can use chat function, Q&A and uh, raise hand function. Well, I guess I've stunned you on to silence. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> yeah, just shy or uh, were there any parts or points that I made that might bear some elaboration um, because it wasn't um, quite as clear as it might have been? That's always a good strategy for asking a question. Maybe I could throw a question out, you know, just to the audience. Um, what do you think of the idea that um, art can be so powerful as to actually um, uh, maybe reform our thinking uh, and even our uh, practices? Um, for example, what do you think of the rom-com? Uh, which, you know, a lot of people, I, I suppose females in particular, or so that's the, the reputation, you know, are, are drawn to. And it's a pretty uh, recognizable formula, boy meets girl or girl meets girl or boy meets boy. And then, you know, loses a uh, girl or boy and then uh, gets them back because uh, very difficult issues uh, that arise have somehow just so, so eloquently and so easily been resolved in the course of two hours. You know, uh, if you're familiar with Jerry Maguire, the Tom Cruise movie from some years ago, and I guess back in the 90s, uh, he had this famous speech to Renee Zellweger, you complete me, you complete me. He's been a total ass up to that point, but he gives that nice speech and then it's it's happily ever after, right? You might say it's not very realistic. Do you think there's any mm, benefit to such movies or is it just really a great example of how such, you know, fiction is really, nothing but an escape mechanism. You know, it's just like a, a nice way of living in a different reality for a couple of hours, but you know, there's a clear line of demarcation between that and, and real life. Or would anyone argue, no, it does more than that. Okay, um, Jack says, 
the Cloud Dream of Nine offers a sudden deliverance of the knowledge that dream and reality are so similar, but it doesn't feel like a mystical realization, even with all of the magic the stories contain. Do you think this is just because it's culturally grounded in spiritual and social beliefs of the time and therefore relatable? Well, I assume you're talking about the kind of non-realistic mythological nature of the story uh, where you do have magic and um, uh, a lot of mythological elements to the tale. I mean, yeah, this is nothing like a modern novel. It's not psychologically uh, grounded. Uh, it's not relatable in terms of having a realistic type of experience. That's, that's definitely uh, true. And so it might be more difficult for us to feel like, you know, the dream functions, I don't know, um, uh, in a way that helps to enlighten us or give us insight, uh, wisdom, and so forth. Um, and yeah, I, I think it has very much to do with literary style. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's a matter of pre-modern versus contemporary um, modes of narration and so forth. And so if uh, Kun Mong is not quite as relatable, that's why I move to contemporary film um, and stories because uh, I, I, I guess their styles that we're used to, but you know, films have so many different um, genres. Like rom com, despite its lack of realism, one might say, a lot of people like it. They relate to it. You know, they're they're responsive to it, whereas a lot of other people can't relate to it. So. Um, I think you have to make allowances for different kinds of narrative styles and even genres. And I don't think my argument about the power of the medium hinges on those issues, because I don't mean to say that every novel and every film has an equal impact on you. Uh, I think individual taste does matter. Uh, and we all have, you know, like differences and what we find truly resonant with us and what we don't. Um, but that, that doesn't uh, subvert what I suggest is the power of the medium in and of itself. Okay, so Jung Ha Yu says, I enjoyed the comparison between Oz and the Buddhist dream. Seems there's more dichotomy in the story of Oz since there happiness uh, and sadness. In Kun Mong, do you think Himandra intended to make some dichotomy between Buddhist and Confucian ideas intentionally? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think Kim Andrung in writing the novel is definitely overtly turning to um, Buddhist tropes. Um, but, in the course of the dream, he's idealizing a Confucian life, but I think perhaps trumping uh, that idealized Confucian life by this process of waking up from the dream or realizing at the end of that Confucian life that it too is merely a momentary um, illusory uh, phenomenon that reverts to, um, you know, impermanence and temporality. Uh, so I think there is a, a kind of play um, where Confucianism is not overtly or completely rejected, but he does say at the end of the novel that there are three ideologies, right? The Buddhist, Confucian, and Taoist, and uh, he says Buddhist, Buddhism trumps it all. So I think in the context of this novel, yeah, he, he makes Buddhism sort of the 
the dominant, but I'm, I'm not sure that that means that in his entire life, that's how he lived or that's how he felt. I would say, again, it depends on the circumstances. Okay, uh, Mona Suzuki says, I think fictional films such as rom-coms set up false expectations within audiences that relationship issues can always be resolved and people always get there happily ever after. I think it's more of an escape from reality. Um, yeah, so I think that would be uh, a common view of rom-coms. And I, I think there is a, a, a lot of substance to that. And I, I hold to that uh, view myself in a lot of ways, but then I thought more about it. I mean, I think there is the real problem of kind of mistaking a rom-com for the way life really ought to be. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but I would say most people who enjoy the genre of film understand that in some ways it's escapism and real life doesn't work like that. So in some ways it's like indulging in a wishful fantasy, knowing full well what you're doing. I think that's where the power of the medium lies because when viewed in, in that frame of mind, I think it's more than just an escape from reality and just kind of giving into wishful thinking. I think it's, it can be a way in which you emotionally cultivate your own ability to overcome the kind of obstacles that are being depicted uh, in these movies. So I, I've noticed something about myself in watching some of these movies. I think some are well done. I think others are just, um, you know, it depends on the quality of the production and acting and all of that. But I'm aware of myself wanting, you know, the uh, characters to get past their problems and kind of, um, celebrating along with them when they do inevitably, you know, overcome the difficulties and love conquers all. I think we have a tendency to dismiss that satisfaction and that experience that people go to the movies for over and over again to experience. We dismiss it somehow as being frivolous. I would ask, does it not inform and even perhaps, you know, not necessarily in dramatic ways and not to the same degree for every person, but does it not cultivate in us? It's, it's almost like a training ground so that when we face our own, you know, interpersonal obstacles that one can sort of act with these ideals in mind. And I think that's why it's very important, you know, this question of what is, is depicted in a movie. Not to say that everyone should be good and all problems should be overcome, but these dramas do train us to see, feel, and ultimately act in certain ideal ways. Movies have that power over us, which is why we should be aware of it. But I think the, the Buddhist insight here is that being aware of it, you can use it. You can use it skillfully because it certainly can be used unskillfully. But the point is the power, the power of the imagination and that ritual context of illusion in actively shaping dispositions uh, and personhood. I don't, I don't know how long we should go, Professor Kim. Um, there's, there's more questions. Should I? Um, yeah. The next can, one? Yeah, just one more question. Maybe then we can kind of wrap up. Everything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the Sarah Moon says, I've read criticisms of Nine Cloud Dream where some argue that the spiritual journey seems too lighthearted without any scorching conflict or contrasting evil. Yeah key elements that are lacking for the novel to be considered an Eastern form of building, building roman. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, and uh, again, it goes to, um, it, it's not in the form of uh, modern realistic psychological novel. Um, I would say, I, I guess these are relative assessments, but compared to something like, I don't know if you're familiar with the 18th century Chinese novel, The Dream of the Red Chamber, which is another Buddhist dream tale. Very long, five volumes in the Penguin Classic Edition and is considered uh, one of the, if not the masterpiece of Chinese classical fiction. And yeah, I would have to say the literary quality of that novel um, is superlative. Um, and it what it does is in the outer frame, it's very mythological, incorporates, you know, natural, uh, I mean, uh, classic Chinese myths. But the dream tale portion is so realistic that most Chinese scholars of the novel, and there's like a whole discipline dedicated to the study of this novel, is convinced that it's a veiled autobiography uh, by the author because historically it's just so realistic and such a good documentation of the nature of, you know, aristocratic life uh, within the Qing dynasty. Um, so, you know, in terms of my personal assessment of Kuen Mong as a literary piece, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, compared to what we expect of it, yeah, it's, it's lighthearted, it's, um, right, psychologically not very kind of, uh, I don't know, involving and the characterizations are not at all kind of individualized. So uh, again, it's, it's up to you. I think any work of art uh, as with any film, whether it moves you, whether the style uh, speaks to you or not are, are very kind of personal uh, sorts of issues. Um, I, I feel like I don't wanna leave Jack out here. <laughs> he has the last, uh, uh, question here. I think some people might argue that while rom-coms are a nice escape from reality and can lighten our emotional psychological burdens, mm -hmm. they can negatively affect societal expectations. Uh, uh, I wonder if there were readers mm -hmm. of the Kuen Mong who resented the peace Shinjin achieved at the end through his dreaming. Mm. I'm not sure what resentment might entail here. Maybe kind of, it doesn't seem realistic would be more of the, crit uh, the critique. Uh, like with the rom-com, it's not very realistic. It's so easily done. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess many people would have that criticism. I think it's useful to remember that there is this structure of the dream tale. So, um, you know, compared to previous short story versions of it, you know, this is much more elaborate uh, and even brings in historical elements such as the uh, campaign against the Tibetans, right? That the dream character of Xiaoyu um, undertakes as one of his many political successes. So um, have to have to look at it in the context of what came before and after. Actually, kind of there's a final question in Q and A by George. Okay. It's kind of related to uh, Jack's question. That's you know this how this you know uh, literature literary work can you know can have a success or a failure, it kind of depends on the readers or audience, right? Mm -hmm. the so that's kind of... Okay, do you think of the indulgence of the text undermines the instructiveness of that kind of moral teaching in the end, complements it, enhances it? 
You mean uh, indulgence in the sense of uh, it depicts all the satisfaction of these worldly desires and that that kind of trumps, you know, the uh, relatively anemic, you know, outer frame tale of, oh, you know, uh, Song Jin wakes up and realizes that this was all vain, um, uh, illusory, um, whatever, satisfactions and, but, but you want to say, no, that's, that's where the interest lies, right? I, I, I'm getting that that's the sense of the question. And if it is, I would say, yes, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point that you notice in yourself how susceptible and how responsive emotionally you are to a work of fiction. And therein lies the Buddhist religious lesson, our susceptibility to fiction. When we notice that at the hands of a overtly fictional work, I think that leads to the realization that what we think to be in contrast, real, like ordinary life is also us being susceptible to and giving in to illusory fictional constructions. And that leads to the question of making choices about what forms of imagination we choose to uh, accept as being important uh, and productive. And we can um, define productivity both in practical terms of living life in the real, the so-called real world, but productive also in terms of attaining wisdom. Uh, so that's, that's the key point. Reflect on your own responsiveness to works of the imagination. Um, it is a problem if you can't understand or recognize the fact that it is a work of the imagination, right? But the ultimate endpoint is that it's all a work of the imagination. And therefore you have choices and you have the responsibility of deciding what kind of imagination you're going to act upon. And I would say that when you look at current affairs, current political context and events, that they all can be attributed to people acting on their choice of imagination. So I, I will end it there. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Cho again for a great lecture and then uh, you know answering all these questions and also I'd like to thank you all for joining uh, this great uh, Zoom talk today. So thank you again. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> I know that you were just deep in thought, thinking, thinking, you know, uh, deep thoughts, uh, and that that took a few minutes. So I thank you for them. <laughs>